Hello. Here we are. I, it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this webinar book launch on the birth of the state, um, the place of the body in crafting modern politics by Charlotte Epstein, who is here with us and who is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies and associate professor at the University of Sydney. Uh, it's a great pleasure to host you. My name is Stefano Guzzini. I'm also senior researcher at DIES, but also professor at Uppsala University and at PUC Rio de Janeiro. But that is all what one needs to know about me because that's not the topic. The topic is uh, Charlotte's book and uh, the discussion that we will have afterwards with the two um, joining us, the Professor Shakabati from the University of Chicago, whom I will introduce a little bit longer afterwards, as well as Naim Inayatullah from Ithaca College um, in the US. And it's a great pleasure to have you both in here. So thanks for joining Naim and uh, Dipesh uh, and for making it possible to have this discussion uh, about um, Charlotte's book, which has come out um, some month ago and has already produced quite some discussion also at the ISA and other places. And I am really happy that we will have a, a possibility of having more of a dialogue and communication here about it these days. So the, the marching order is relatively easy. We will have uh, first Professor Chakrabarti um, and presenting some of his comments, suggestions, questions, and uh, Charlotte answering. And then Naeem is doing the same. Uh, and Charlotte is coming back before we open up for Q&A. And for everyone who's joining as a, as a participant, you can join us in the Q&A session by using the Q&A button, um, uh, not the chat button, uh, for doing so. So thanks very much uh, for, for being with us. Um, and um, yes, that's very much true. I, I, um, I should mention that we have, unfortunately, not uh, Annabel Brett, a professor uh, from the University of Cambridge with us who unfortunately couldn't make it uh, for tonight. So that's a pity. So we will have to, um, but we will have a little bit more time than in the discussion with the one, uh, with the two who are able to join. Thanks again. And Professor Shakabati will unfortunately also have to leave at uh, what is his 12 o'clock, I think our seven o'clock and for whatever you are in the world might be somewhere else, but it's roughly in an hour from now. Um, so here we are. So um, the introduction for Professor Shakabati should uh, could be very, very, very long. So I, I try not to make it too long. So he's a Lawrence A. Kimpton professor in history, South Asian languages and civilizations and the college. One, one day you will explain to me what and the college means uh, because it's not self-evident uh, for, for anyone outside probably Chicago at the University of Chicago, as well as a faculty director of the uh, University of Chicago Center in Delhi. He studied and that's maybe not known, but might be helpful also for the discussion afterwards. Physics, management, before turning to history and um, has become, I mean, a world famous scholar, uh, nothing less um, for South Asian history, but also mainly for post-colonial studies and for the recent turn that you have taken and, and taken climate change and planetary politics and planetary history uh, very seriously. So the main books, among the many uh, from this very start, it's about rethinking working class history. So that's the link also to South Asian history from the very start. Then the famous provincializing Europe, which has become a, a trope uh, in, in, in the post-colonial environment and the very recent climate of history in the planetary age from 2021. So thank you very much for joining Professor Shakabati and the floor is yours. No, <laughs> uh, this is, what, this is what, what always happens when you make these kind of things and you, you are happy to see other people. In principle, I said um, that there was nothing else to follow, but in fact, I have an introduction to do. So here you go. Nobody says that I'm nervous while doing these things. Here he comes and there's a major, a major uh, um, yeah, mess up at the very beginning. So let me start. Sorry for, uh, for this, Professor Shakabati. I will do a little bit afterwards, but my, my task was to help everyone to have a little bit of a background of the book and therefore to give a, a little bit of an introduction. So, so far, so far for messing, messing, thing, messing Not things. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, uh, don't, don't worry. Is, is no, I mean, uh, in a way, Charlotte 
book is no, no, no. Wait, wait. You will have to wait, unfortunately. That's the oh, point. Okay. <laughs> so I, I will have, although I've introduced you, I will have to do now the introduction of the book before before you start. Okay. Uh, so that you will, that there will be some background that you will be able. Very happy to wait. <laughs> and so no problem. And it's all recorded. So everyone will see how, how things uh, can go wrong. So here we are. So the book is uh, tracing and the main thing about it is that it traces the state and the modern subject of rights back to its origins in the 17th century in England. Now, that is to some extent the story that we have heard already, because it's about the beginnings of modernity. But what makes the book special is the central role given to the body. According to Epstein, the body works at the place from which she analyzes the co-constitution of the state and the political subject, the subject of rights. So on the one hand, the body will become the taken for granted, the unconstituted, that provides the condition for the possibility of the relation between the state and the subject to emerge. But on the other hand, it is mythologically speaking, also the, the, the mirror point from which, through which, so to speak, this constitution is analyzed. So it has two components. And on one hand, the body will appear um, as that via which the constitution of the state and the subject is taking place, but also methodologically speaking, through which we do this. And I come to this a little bit back later because it's an interesting twist of how to go about the story. So she, start, she studies the process in 16th and 17th century England and to some parts uh, of uh, Europe as well, the Netherlands and France. Um, and thus the classical move from the medieval times in Europe at least, with its given cosmic hierarchical natural order to an, that move that then goes to the open infinite universe where order became a question of ordering. Hence the defining problematique of this time had to do with ordering, both the epistemic ordering of how to think this order anew and the political ordering that results from it. And as Epstein shows, the human body was intimately bound up in both projects. Indeed, one of the main arguments of the book as well is that the two projects cannot possibly be understood independently of each other. So how is this going to be done? So the body is this place from which to think this co-constitution, the emergence of the modern state and political subject. In doing this, um, Epstein reverses a little bit the usual way that we go about it in the kind of Foucauldian um, tradition, because it is not just the body as the privileged side on which the deployment of modern power can be analyzed and understood, the assujettissement in Foucault, but it reverses it by putting the lens backwards, mythologically speaking, backwards from the body to the constitution of sovereignty as there is. So the body is not just a reflection uh, of the functioning of modern power, but becomes a mirror via which this constitution or co-constitution can be understood. So the body has three different roles, three main different roles in the book. As she writes, it's an object of observation in space, in, in science, an instrument of observation, which leads to this primacy of vision and the scopic regime, as she calls it, and the medium, and that's very important for the general purpose of the book, a medium for the naturalization of the relation between state and subject. Uh, it turns it into a taken for granted relation where nature and the natural are given a new place in the reference of the new political ordering. Now, the book is then structured in three parts, which each explore one of the three foundational and absolute rights, the knots, as she calls it, that bound together the subject and the state, namely security, liberty, and property. And it is covered with classical texts on the one hand, but then always with practices that are attached to it, such as law, or at the end, medicine, anatomy. So the first part, mainly driven from a discussion of Hobbes is about security. Here Epstein shows how the body was drawn upon to naturalize security as the necessary and sufficient foundation of this new subject state relation and of the state as the durable modern polity. By understanding security as a natural need, the state is rendered unquestionable 
as the guarantor of the right to protection with the obligation of the state to step in to keep us safe by all means. So for Hobbes, this is also a possibility to introduce that which will become a major figure in liberal thought, the art of separation, which is the art of separation also of the private and the public, in which the private can allow conscience to be expressed where the public can't and therefore would be a possibility to assure higher security uh, within this particular liberal order. The next one is liberty. So the second part of the book is about traces how individual liberty was constructed as natural and contestable by being attached to the body. So the body served to individualize the right to liberty and in the same process the then individual of legal modernity was forged. So individualization becomes the major issue here. So here she shifts from analyzing texts to analyzing practices that emerged during the English Revolution as the threshold of legal modernity. It is um, the kind of material that she uses is practices related to tolerance during the Reformation, but court cases about the naturalization of a potential citizen, but also mainly the introduction of the principle of habeas corpus in English common law. This body that emerges here is a different body than the body that was typical for the time before, because it's no longer a collective body attached to a specific place, but an individual body that underwrites modern liberty and is attached to a certain territory, an abstract space of the state. So it allows both liberty on the one hand and the centralization, if you wish, of authority on the other. Finally, part three is about property. Uh, here, just as in the part before, John Locke is one of the main interlocutors. Um, the body here served to privatize property. It's from the common, uh, the commons that have been initially as the word says, shared, property needed to define or was to be defined within the capitalist changes as something that needed was, was privatized, set up. And the body, again, shows how this is done. Most importantly, though, there's a long discussion and very interesting discussion, I believe, on the role of the slave. Because, of course, in an ordering that is going on, being this the main if you wish, topic that comes out of this vision of the body. In this ordering, it is not so self-evident in early uh, modern times how to have an ordering that is based on equality and yet run slavery. And so the, the, the uh, not always particularly nice quotes um, from Locke or, or Hume show how private property was defined in such a way to allow the stratification of some parts who usually through the theory of labor would be included into humankind not to be included into humankind and therefore prepare the ground for what will afterwards um, develop as a racist discrimination or a racist stratification um, in modern times. So the book does retrace this co-constitution, does it in a novel way by looking at the body both as a mythological starting point and yet also as an ontological uncontested taken for granted upon which that story and the, the, the new philosophy, if you wish, but also new practices can be built. And then that opens up the question uh, for the relevance of the book, namely to reopen and denaturalize. In that regard, it's a genuine genealogy, though it reverses the Foucauldian lens, it, uh, it stays in the Foucauldian tradition and tries to open up thinking space and acting space uh, for the exclusionary moves that she has shown in, across the three underlying rights, because these rights despite the fact that they should be all equal, come all with the exclusion of the socially poor, of the criminal who is put in the anatomic uh, uh, theater, as it is actually called, uh, because they needed corpses in which corpses would you find once you have digged them all up uh, from the cemetery that you could get. So they would be criminals. And to some extent, there were even arrangements of which criminals um, uh, could become in. The slave and gender. 
and there's um, you might we might come back to this a, bit, a little bit later because there's also in this particular last chapter on the anatomy a, a gender component which is in there. So it is the past which we have in the present, um, and it is a past that needs to be um, unpacked, denaturalized in order to help us having thinking and acting space, and this is done through this vision of the body in the co-constitution of the modern subject and the modern state. And now I should have made the introduction to Professor Chakrabat. So I'm really sorry for this uh, hiccup um, because now, but people will not have forgotten your position uh, and what you have done beforehand because nobody uh, who is listening in, I would not expect any one of them not to know who actually you are. But so I, I'm very happy um, to move over and to have you in uh, having your comments given to the to Charlotte. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stefano, and uh, uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, and to be here with Charlotte and Naim to discuss this great book uh, that I've learned a lot from. So I'll time myself. I'll speak for about ten minutes in the interest of time. I unfortunately have to go. Uh, 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 at 12 my time uh, and apologize in advance. Uh, it's really my loss, not to be part of it. So I'll time myself for 10 minutes so that uh, then I'll stop at 10 and then whatever uh, it is left that we picked up, if I have time, I can I can, I can uh, dis discuss those things. Okay, let me oh, go back to my timer and okay. Um, so first of all, Charlotte, a wonderful uh, book and heartiest congratulations. I, I loved the uh, I loved the, the way you structured it. I found it extremely erudite. I also found it extremely rigorous in the way you take your reader step by step through your argument. And it, every chapter you you say what you, what you're going to argue. You um, take your reader through. Um, it's really through your, not just the argument of the steps in the argument, it's one of those books that actually, it's great for anybody wanting to um, learn about how to think of this, of, about this kind of a problem, because you make the structure of your thinking visible uh, and uh, what, you, what one might call your method or your, the structure of your thought. And, and my, I mean, since I don't, I'm not an early modernist of European history, I'm, I don't, I can't criticize the book from within the field. I'm very impressed by the book simply because, you know, I, I take an, an amateur's interest in these figures and in these questions, but also these questions have been so much worked upon, the figures have been so much worked upon that uh, any scholar would, be, would fear a kind of diminishing returns uh, prospect. So therefore, one can't not admire uh, uh, how much labor you've put into it, and and the ret and the returns are wonderful. I mean, it, so it, I know that it's not a mean thing to be able to say something new and original about these people, about just reading these people and how you read them. So both your method and what you produce, I, I mean, are, are very striking, and I congratulate you. It's a great book. So having said that, let me, in the interest of time, go to where. Um, where I both admire you, and but I also have some questions, which is really about how you think. And with the word birth, you you signal your affiliation to Foucault and Nietzsche and the genealogical tradition uh, uh, with the word birth in the title of the book. But what I find the book doing, it kind of does two different things. I mean, you use the word deconstruction uh, sometimes with respect to the people you're studying, but, but actually the way you work the two nature thesis uh, into the question of the body uh, and work out the, the, the indeterminacy of which view of the nature is at work. So that this, this question of that, we are always switching codes between two views of nature. I mean, reminded me a lot of Derrida's uh, way of reading something. So in a way there's, I mean, I find, so in showing that the, that the transition in thought, in political thought from the so-called medieval to the so-called modern is not a rupture. And, and the body itself is a problem of kind of 
ambiguity uh, that it kind of brings together those two conceptions of nature in in the way that one one thinks about the body uh, and and i think that is both a good it becomes a good genealogical exercise where you um, um, like particularly your work with Edward Koch and the, and the, and the legal cases where you actually off, open yourself up to the contingencies of historical movements. But it's also a deconstructive reading uh, to take a text and actually go to its fundamentally unstable dualis, dualities that hold the, that kind of holds the text and to then demonstrate the instability of, of, of the duality. So I, th I thought that was great. but but because you're writing the book now and you're, you're very, you pose yourself the whole problem of, by implicit, why, why write the book now? And your introduction, your conclusion throughout uh, the discussion of property and who gets excluded from property. Uh, clearly you want to address, I mean, that's the aspirational part of your book that you actually want to throw a light into our modern contemporary condition by going back to the so-called origins uh, or doing a genealogy of, of origins. And that's where I found the, the method changing because that's where I found that, that there's an assumption and not just on your part. I mean, I've sometimes found it this on my part uh, in writing things I've written. And sometimes, and I don't think that instinct is Foucauldian. It's more a structuralist instinct where you, you think that once you've uncovered a relationship that's of fundamental importance, to at the fundamentally important at the in the origination of a category which you're interested in. So so there is a there is a so let's say the category state is still extremely relevant, like the category capital. But but you're also showing us when the category emerges. You're giving us a reading of when the category emerges. And sometimes there's an assumption that if I can unravel the fundamental um, conditions within which the category emerges as a fundamental relationship in modern life, then the structure itself will explain the problems we face 300 years down the line. So that somehow reading the exclusions in Locke will give me insights on contemporary racism or, uh, or same with Hobbes. And, and, and you're not the only person who does it. I mean, some structuralist Marxists would read Marx like that once the capital labor opposition is instituted in society and in thought, certain things follow. Or uh, with regard to climate change, uh, it is often said that, you know, my, I mean, and I say this of, friends I tremendously admire and respect, like I admire and respect you. Uh, Latour, for instance, or even Philip Driscoll, I mean, anthropologists often, particularly anthropologists given to structuralist thinking, often would say that once the nature culture opposition was put into place uh, in European opposition, in European experience or by the scientific re revolution so-called, um, it's, um, it's the beginning of a disaster. So in your discussion, for instance, of Descartes' uh, description of, um, of a view of nature, which is about mastery of nature. Uh, and this happens with other, some other categories as well. You are, you act, actually write that, that once we have this, we have the prospect of an ecological catastrophe. But for me, the, the, the passage from the aspiration to master nature and the actual uh, coming about of a catastrophe has a lot of history in between. So, so if I read, so for instance, um, let's take the question of race uh, and exclusion. So I would, one could argue that even in English uh, political thought, exclusions that remain structural for Locke are exclusions about which, exclusions that John Stuart Mill will view as temporal, 
and through a notion of history, you know, that, that Indians and Africans have to wait before they can be self-governing, let's say. And therefore, once you see them as temporal and historical, that also can become the, the excuse for temporizing on the giving of the rights. Um, on the other hand, um, where I found your structuralist reading very productive, for instance, in connecting constructivism and, and, the, and the, um, the, the crafting, that, the word that you use, with the question of the will, what you do allow me to see is that is the very is that is that very um, fundamental and for me it's a historical relationship. It's a problem of history posed by this question, relationship between um, between structure and and the thought of structural transformation and the messy process of history. And your connection with the uh, question of crafting and will actually lets me see that see that that later on revolutionaries from Lenin to Fano will use the idea of the will to overturn the structure. So Fano will actually lay claim to the human, right? And 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 try to get out of the problem of this exclusion by a revolutionary leap. Uh, Ambedkar in India does it for the Dalits, where he says, I want Indian history to begin from 1789. But what the book shows, what the book reminds you is that, so that's my end of 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll, let me wrap up this and let you, let you respond. But the, what the book reminds me is really that, that, that however much there might be a revolutionary desire for the leap, for the will, the will always gets messed up by actual histories. And if you, so, so let me finish, finishing this, let me say this then. See, in Foucault's, the way that Foucault comes to biopower and why I like Foucault over the structuralists is because he's always open to historical contingency, right? So, so there's a point at which he thinks something like, a, again, a natural category, quote unquote, population emerges at the end of the 18th century. And it cannot be dealt with by discipline, by regulation, by sovereignty. So state institutions have to devise other strategies for dealing with it. And it's contingent, right? And that's why it's so, so as a historian, I would say it, if I had, if I had to um, learn something from your book um, or engage your book from, from what I'm working on, what I've been thinking about, uh, just to give this example, that I, I think of, I think of there having been an ecological, real ecological catastrophe that we are living through, but I don't see it as having happened inevitably from the desire to master nature. I think it's the particular way in which you wanted to master nature. The history of technology, the history of population, the history of antibiotics, the history of public health, you know, a lot of those things had to come together to produce the catastrophe, but whereas, so let me say this provocatively, that, that, that in today's world, I find in this kind of structuralist thinking, I find it very, very European. And if I may say so Christian, because what happens in this thought is that the original structure becomes something like an original sin. I mean, <laughs> once, <laughs> once it's happened, <laughs> you know, you have to pay for it. Uh, whereas I think the hope for Asian modernizers, African modernizers, I'm going back to the 1950s, the hope, the historical hope they had for development, for solving poverty, until Deng Xiaoping, that modernization will solve poverty, that China was not bent, bent to be a poor socialist country, that hope was actually based on a historical reading of all these exclusions, and therefore anchored in the thought that historically we can overcome these problems. Uh, that, we have, that we have run into an ecological logjam is a different, is a different question. Why? So I'll just say this and, and end here. Thank you. Thank you, Deepesh. Thank you very much. Charlotte. Thank you. Um, 
This is exciting. Um, exciting because I'm very surprised to be read this way. Uh, so that's, 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 you know, this is how you find out what you've actually produced. <laughs> um, but I guess, uh, so maybe what I'll do, uh, the, the two nature thesis is precisely the one that I, I that I hoped to, that you would, you would pick up on, but I might ex actually explain a little bit what, what's going on there. Um, and it has to do with what you mentioned in terms of this deconstruction, uh, this, this deconstruction effort, which is why I'm surprised to be read as the structuralist. So this is interesting. So let's work through this. Um, so by two natures, one of the things that I'm trying to do is 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 to you know to actually reinvest and recharge this rather old-fashioned word, which is um, naturalize and denaturalize, or rather to recharge the word denaturalizing, right? Um, in order to make it because it really has fallen out of fashion I had found yet and this is something I'm not willing to to give up. Um, only the thing that I do uh, in order to recharge it is that I also bring the nature in relation to which things are naturalized or not naturalized. So in other words, to make denaturalizing a critical concept again, right? something that does work to get us to see the ways in which spe historically specific historical constructs are made to seem natural, right? that's the work of denaturalizing, what I do is I go and fetch nature, the nature behind it. And my discovery, I guess, and this was a real discovery, I wasn't expecting to find this, um, by going back, and this is why I make this moment so foundational, so I'm sort of beginning to answer your question, uh, the 17th century, is that, you know, everyone, first of all, it starts from an inherent contradiction in Hobbes, that some people see him as Mr. Natural, natural Law, right? That's the classical reading, and other people see him as the modern scientist, the materialist, right? And then I realized that no one has actually realized that actually what he's having to reconcile is two completely different natures that are coming into view at this point in time. And this, this, I think, is completely foundational because this, these two natures that I think are still us with still, um, and I think Latour would probably agree with that, I think this is what we haven't really uh, looked at. So that doesn't yet answer your, your question. I guess what I, in, 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 in thinking about your question for some time now today, I don't see myself as uncovering a structure so much as I see myself as uncovering structuring work the work of structuring, right? And I was thinking, you know, why the state subject relation, right? I think, well, because this, 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 this relation that got configured or constructed historically contingency uh, in the 17th century to address very specific problems at that time, which is to put an end to the wars of religion, okay? Um, that same relation is still the one that, I mean, walking out of COVID, right, I don't think any of us hasn't felt very intensely that state subject relation every time we walk out of our house or we're not able to walk out of our house. So I would say that that structuring work is still very decisive, but I don't think I'm looking at a structure that was put in place I'm, I'm thinking of Latour here and the nature culture thing. I don't think I'm looking at a structure that was put in place once and for all and that didn't move, but I am looking at a relationship that is fundamentally structuring of our polity up until today. And I think we can really, I mean, like, yeah, I think COVID is one of the best places where we encountered the state as, 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 uh, as citizens. But I, and I want to say, so the, the reason I'm a little surprised is that, I mean, but you, you, you brought that thing, what was going to be my answer, which is that the, my other main focus is indeed this business of agency. Um, so two things. First of all, contingency is my friend and contingency is what I need in order to deploy my critique, right? So that was the other thing I was going to say to, to build a little bit on what Stefano explained about my use of the body. One of the reasons I use the body is that, so I take the state and the subject as these two constructs that emerged in the 17th century, not a structure, I would say, but constructs. And, and, and contingency, for me, the ultimate contingent thing is actually the body. Right? The body in its manyness and its multiplicity is the thing that's always been around in history, right? It's in a way completely contingent, right? And that's my kind of provocation is to take the site, site of contingency, to mobilize the, the, the very contingent thing in order to, um, how did I put it? I put it somewhat uh, more cogently. I mobilize contingency via the body to denaturalize the structuring work that is made to pass as natural again and again. So, and it's, it's funny because, so one more thing, I just, uh, I won't be too long about this, but on your, um, so on this ecological catastrophe, that was going to be, as I un had understood your question initially when you sent it to me, but I realized we're on the same page because what I was going to say is that for me, this, I actually hold separate 
in a way that you know ends of thesis uh, end uh, deaths of nature theses as I call them don't and a tendency to sort of dismiss Descartes and Cartesianism. I actually hold quite separate this business that I'm trying to circumscribe, which is the agency, the very distinctly human agency that emerges in the 17th century, just to explain for our, our, our listeners, that is not gods anymore, uh, that is distinctly human, that has to push away against both God and nature, right? This agency didn't have to be, I, I, and this is actually, this, you're, we actually are in agreement, it didn't have to be about ecological destruction at all. It's the way it got configured at a particular point in time that made that happen. But I'm actually keen to hang on to that agency precisely for the reasons that you say. Because this agency is both what created the state and locked us into private property, which I think will be my answer to Naeem, but also the thing that can make us change it. And without this agency, there's no changing it at all. So I, am, I guess I'm intrigued that you, that you read me as more, as more um, structuralist than I want to be because I really do see myself as thoroughly deconstructionist. Yeah. Sorry, Charlotte, I miscommunicated myself. I don't think your analysis of the 17th century issues are structuralist. Yeah, okay. But but I found you I find out find you to be structuralist in the what what you call the aspirational aspects of the book. So the way you want to connect up with Judith Butler's writing set, or the way you want to connect up with contemporary issues. That's mm -hmm. where structuralist in the sense that what was that you assume that what was fundamental in the 17th century yeah. is still globally fundamental. I bet you, if you went to India and look at the state subject relationship through the pandemic, you'd find that relationship is far more performed as a farce than you know, as a deeply set relationship. But, but it is, so what, so, so I'm saying that the, what you see as fundamental May not be in may not have as much of a determining role mm. with all the other things that come about in history. Yeah. So I'm not saying I, it's extinguished, but yeah. it may not have that determining. Role. And yeah. can I also say on the nature question? Yeah. On the nature question, you see, one can. I mean, you're totally right, and that's why I found it very illuminating the way you bring the Aristotelian notion of you know uh, both place and nature uh, and the scholastic notion into conversation with this what the kind of nature that's emerging out of uh, the so-called scientific revolution. At the same time, one could argue that today, uh, we just have one nature and it's a more whited notion of nature where everything is in motion. Their evolutionary uh, history happens slowly. You know, some aspects of human history happen very fast. Geological history happens slowly, but, and the reason why I say this is for the whole question of this, this the question you raise, which is, a which is a fundamental question and that's become fundamental in the context of uh, the pandemic is the security of human life, right? So the security of human life. And you see, one could argue, and actually evolutionary biologists argue this, that if, if, even if you look at cave, the history of cave dwelling humans in the history of the species, a fundamental, requirement for human society to flourish and, and continue was the, the need for security from wild animals. And of course, what Hobbes does, he puts the whole question of wild animals into the state of nature. So he says that wild animals are part of the war of all against all, and therefore humans have the right to kill wild animals because, because wild animals can kill them. So, so in effect, one could, one could argue that that instead of, um, because your critique of Hobbes is that you say that you want to get back to a history where uh, security of life is not the only thing that humans demand. But I'm saying you can hold on to one notion of nature from geological to scientific to evolutionary biology where everything is in motion, mm -hmm. nothing is at rest. Mm -hmm. And one could use that history to actually argue that the, the requirement of security is very deep in human evolutionary history. And Heidegger has a beautiful discussion of the German, ancient German word for dwelling, which he says includes a concern for security and safety. Okay, so I guess the latter is exactly what I'm contesting. That is true. Um, and I'm just contesting it for the following reasons. So first, the, the first point. Uh, so it is, I guess I am looking for the, again, it's the structuring work. 
And it's this long line of history, right? So I have no problem accepting that it changes, that it's different, that when the subject becomes the citizen, it becomes something else, and that it's different in every single almost state, state subject relation. I think I can encompass that. But I still think that you know you can take the long view of history and look at the work of structuring that does get actualized through these differences and despite these differences. On the security, so that's exactly where I will beg to differ. And that is because, uh, you know, the, this is perhaps because of the difference of where we're coming from. In, in, our, in our field, nature, if you like, is the ultimate given, right? So it is exactly the thing that the state can turn to and, stay and say, no, no, we know, we know that you need to feel secure as per your evolutionary biological needs. And therefore we will provide it to you. And we will provide it to you in such a way that you shouldn't really look at how we're going to do it because we know that it is your need. So this natural need becomes in the game of politics, in, in, the, in the way in which security has been turned into a natural life, something that I find very dangerous. And so for me, it's very, it was very precious to find out that, 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 that actually nature was never seen as one single thing, that even that the ultimate given, the positivity, the ultimately positive was never as stable as we thought it was, even in our, our knowledge of it. And that's precious for doing this work of short circuiting these 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 political moves that sh that shut down freedom, that shut down agency, but in the name of keeping us safe. So that that is. I, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I think time should come in. I won't. I don't want to hog time, but just let me just say that all my criticisms or critiques of your book are by way of paying you a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the book made me think about these things, and 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 I hope you and I will have opportunity. Me to too. discuss this more yeah but it's a wonderful book and congratulations once thank you Deepesh. thank you very much and uh thank you also for the the engaged dialogue which i think uh, works really nicely so it's my pleasure to turn to the second uh interlocutor uh dialoguing partner uh, namely naim inayatullah who is a professor at ithaca college and uh, who who also covers it's remarkable how how much our our invitees can cover uh, covers also a very wide ground and is surely known for a remarkable curiosity which uh, it's not going via physics management and uh, to history but there you will for the ones who don't know him we will we will get there as well so he starts by saying that he is interested in the history of economic thought. And so did Smith, Hegel, Marx, but not Ricardo. We, we will keep that for another time when you will tell us why that's the case. So he has an interest in international political economy, but exactly not the kind of international political economy which became international political economy uh, ever since the 90s. So he has a way of looking at this in a more, much more cultural and historical environment. And, uh, and is therefore linking up in fact, with political economy in the very strong sense of the word, something which is very often no longer no longer done. Although, um, I mean, there's some attempts to to reread Keynes, but there he is, there's really much more included. And by by doing this, he has also the capacity to cover basically a rather wide range of theories of international relations, which is not just the usual, because that we have all learned, but takes it from, from a different angle, uh, from well, that angle, which also became then, I think, to some extent also famous, and together with David Blaney in the Savage Economics uh, book, which has a, a quite startling title, um, almost like the provincializing Europe, on the other hand, which I think is a has been a, I, I, I'm, I'm a very important book for rethinking political economy in a different manner. But, and this is, of course, I, I cannot but, um, but mention it because uh, it's a common interest of us. Um, he has also written about pedagogy, but also about music. So um, gigging on the world stage about Bossa Nova uh, and, uh, and um, published in Contexto Internacional and um, in the Brazilian journal, always open to the many places um, what, what Deepesh called also remote places sometimes, although Rio is not um, one of the most remote <laughs> in that regard. Um, and, and this enormous curiosity, which makes, it, makes him an, a very uh, obvious interlocutor for, for such a rich book as Charlotte's book that we have today. So I'm very happy 
to to have him here and uh, to share share some some time with him and uh, having some dialogue even if i just listen to the dialogue and can no longer enjoy the ones that we used to have while being in ithaca so naim uh, the floor is yours thank you stefano that's a very generous introduction i have a talk and let me get to it <clears throat> Uh, my talk is divided into four parts, a short introduction, a short section on Marxist labor theory of value, a long section on Locke that I've been furiously trying to condense and which will likely try your patience, and then a short closing. So the introduction. I love this book. I love that the distinction between place and space will now stay in my head forever. I love how Charlotte makes sense of Locke's famous chapter on property, which up until now had struck me as a series of bizarre moves by Locke. I love her mapping of so many of the major figures in the Western canon. I love, love, love the tour of the paintings. And I can't, I couldn't get enough of the dissection chapter, which I can easily see becoming a Netflix show any, sometime soon. Originally, I wanted to skim the book, but I couldn't. It held me in its grip and dissolved my concern for other responsibilities. The book is an important event in our field, and I dare say that it will become a classic. In the acknowledgments, Charlotte writes, this book has taken me a long time to write, a longer time still to read for and to think through. I can barely imagine. It would take me at least three lifetimes to master the literature she marshals with relaxed confidence it's as if Charlotte traveled to some planet where time ticks slowly, sleep is unnecessary, and energy flows from fountains. She returns to our planet with this book in hand, like Jodie Foster in the, in the film Contact. Otherworldly, otherworldly is my one word description of this book. I can describe my experience of reading it by analogy to the music of Steve Reich, in which waves of insight materialize in the foreground then recede into the background as new waves emerge to claim our attention. In every chapter, Charlotte has us surfing on swells generated by hundreds of percussive details. Each chapter is fully a world unto itself. I will read it many times to absorb its richness. But abstract, even concrete praise seems inadequate. I want to suggest that my best compliment is in fact nested in my criticism. So, my first question, who is the target of this book? Two more questions. First, what does it matter that the body is at the center of how modernity addresses security, liberty, and property? Second, if, as Charlotte writes, the juncture of the epistemological and the political is a proper locus of critique, then I thank her for giving me a magnificent map of the epistemological shifts from Aristotle to Aquinas, to Puffendorf and Grotius, to Hobbes and Locke. But I wonder if the book's delivery favors the epistemological over the political. This book demonstrates how intimate are Hobbes and Locke in our collective life, but I do not yet glean Charlotte's reason for showing us this intimacy. I need a melody I can hum as I leave this book. I need a political punch that my muscles can absorb as a necessary pain. So I'm shifting to a different section now. <clears throat> Most critical race theory, critical feminism, and Marxism depend on the concept of exploitation. Contemporary scholars do so without acknowledging and often without knowing that their use of exploitation is based on Marxist labor theory of value. Nor do they know that Marxist labor theory of value is highly contested. In the massive literature that examines the status and coherence of Marxist labor theory of value, most agree that value is vivified in the realm of production in the realm of production through the consumption of the commodity labor power. There is no dispute here about the primacy of production over circulation. The debate is about the role of circulation itself, and specifically about the relationship between production and circulation. Does the circulation process, that is, the market, merely reflect the value that is already created in production? Or do markets play a determining role in assessing what counts as value and therefore as labor? This dispute can be seen as a tension between a foundational principle, namely the labor that labor creates value in production, and the social determination of that principle, 
namely whether value is really assessed via social consent. Foundational principle versus social consent. This central tension in Marx's labor theory of value is, I submit, inherited from Locke. Locke posits a foundational principle, namely that property accrues as a result of individuals mixing their labor with the nature of the nature given objects. This principle is in tension with the idea that property and value must be recognized and consented to by others to count as property and as value. Foundational principle versus social consent. Okay. So here's the long section on Locke, most of which is I'm getting from Charlotte's book in the first place. Locke's first treatise is a refutation of the theological and patriarchal arguments in Filmer's Patriarcha, which argued for a divine right of kings via biblical support. The second treatise then presents the positive program of how property might be derived as such, that individuals can claim it without restoring to a patriarchal biblical lineage. In Locke's famous chapter five on property, he presents his labor theory of property and a qualitative version of the labor theory of value. Locke is famous for the novelty of his theory of property. That novelty is best seen by showing his continuity with the thinkers of his time. It was understood that all humans have a right to the goods that nature provides. That right is licensed by scriptures, but also by natural law of self-preservation. The problem is that such an argument licenses all humans. Communism is the original condition. Locke's task was to get, this, get out of this original communism by providing an argument for individual property ownership, but without resort to the kind of reasoning provided by Filmer, for whom everything belongs to the nobility via the divine right of kings. That is, although God gave humans equal right to the earth's resources, it is particular humans who need those resources for food, clothing, and shelter. Grotius and Puffendorf overcame this problem by arguing that social consent activated private property within the state of nature. All agreed to give up their rights to the goods that each was to use individually. Locke rejected this argument by consent, claiming instead that private property was established in the state of nature, not by consent of mankind, but by natural law. This is the foundational principle that signals Locke's moment of originality. Peter Laslett makes a big deal of this originality as can be seen as this quote of his. He suddenly, Locke, he suddenly departs from all his predecessors, classical and medieval. Locke introduces here a motive for the establishment of political society, which few had considered in the context of political origins and none had given much prominence. He abruptly injects into the discussion the concept of property. Locke's strength and weakness is that the, he bypasses the problem of social consent, as does Marx, argue some of his critics. By doing so, Locke brings forth a novel theory of property, something that we still discuss today as we're doing now. Yet the issue of social consent cannot be bypassed without consequences that Locke must face but cannot acknowledge. The way out of original, original communism was to argue for occupancy, at least when it came to land. Those who occupy land can claim it as theirs. But as Hobbes shows, occupancy cannot be considered a stable basis for property unless it is recognized by others. Otherwise, one's occupancy is just the prelude to the next claimant's forced expulsion and subsequent occupancy. Hobbes, like Grotius and Puffendorf, insisted on the relevance of social consent. The need for consent, however, creates its own problem. It implies that every individual in the world has consented to every act of property acquisition. And for Locke, this meant in effect that the individual property acquisition became impossible. Locke had to steer between the rock of the contemporary theory of property, the compact theory, excuse me, I'll do that again. Locke had to steer between the rock of the compact theory of property and the hard place of robbery. Both seemed to disallow individual claims to property. As I said, all of this is already in Charlotte's book. <sighs> Initially, Locke's state of nature contains no human-made products. Nature's abundance provisions human needs. It spontaneously generates the acorns, apples, fruits, and venison, which the wild Indian in the state of nature mixes his labor with, thereby making nature's product his own. Locke writes, the fruit or venison which nourishes the wild Indian must be his and so is his 
That is, it is a part of him that none other can have the right to. Locke asks, will anyone say he had no right to those acorns or apples he thus appropriated because he had not the consent of all mankind? This is the crucial move. If we take his rhetorical question as a real one, his answer is not as straightforward as it may seem. For example, the Indian could take the fruit and venison, venison back to his family or his nation, where someone who is authorized to make the decision would circulate the goods according to some tacit understanding or explicit rule. Distribution could follow rank, reputation, age, gender, or even need. Indeed, the term property might seem irrelevant to Indians who may not even consider exclusive possession, much less think of themselves as individuals who labor. Thus, a response to Locke's question might well be, while the Indian may not need the consent of all kind, nevertheless, the Indian may well depend on a tacit or cultural consent for removing something from the common. As I suggested above, there is no way around this issue of consent. Locke can make universal claims only by abstracting from cultural specificity. Locke then takes the reader to a more advanced temporal state in his speculative history. The pivot is the invention and institution of money. With the development of money, the state of nature that was so abundant becomes a space of scarcity instead. Before money, Locke limited the appropriation of goods with two conditions. There could be no waste and there had to be enough left for others. After humans have agreed to use money, however, one is allowed to appropriate beyond one's immediate needs and then exchange the surplus for money, an entity that does not spoil. Money activates in some the desire for having more than men need. The desire in turn motivates the industrious and the rational to accrue wealth via exchange. Such accumulation produces differential wealth generating different ranks of people, for example, masters and servants. Money motivates accumulation and money leads to inequality. These are the two poles of the tragedy of capitalism, the accumulation of wealth within a bourgeois hierarchy. While Locke, does not decipher, de, while Locke does not decipher the full logic of capitalism, he provides the ideological key that supports it, namely a theory of desert. That is, claims about who deserves wealth and property and who does not. Here are his principles. You get nothing if you go against God's command to labor. That is how the Amerindians are dispossessed as well as the poor. If you spoil and waste nature's products by not leaving enough for others, you rob them. But after the instituting of money, there is no limit to accumulation. The spiraling circuits of capital are legitimated from this removal of limits. Allow me to close now. I'm trying to make the case that what is missing in the birth of the state is a melody that I can hum. That is an explicitly stated politics. I can imagine Charlotte responding, look, Naeem, the contest over private property is perhaps the ultimate political fight. And it is via Locke's innovations that we have allowed ourselves to believe that the property making he envisages is the most natural of things. If we want to imagine and constitute a world different from capitalism, it must be through a critique of Locke's ideas on labor, value, and property. This response is the melody that I was unable to hear in her otherwise astonishing, rich and clear book. But I suspect I'm not the only one with poor ears out here. Had I been lucky enough to be an editor of this book, I would have demanded an explicitly political statement that delivers such a punch. You have this current Charlotte. It's enough for both of us. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Naeem. Charlotte. How to go after Naeem um, and his melodies. Um, well, what I'll do, uh, what I'll do is propose something, right? Um, and in responding to this substantial question that you raise about consent um, and, uh, and uh, consent as opposed to, well, yes, just to correct your reading a little bit. For me, Locke does not bypass consent at all. He is in fact, the theorist of government by consent. That's how he starts the book. Except it looks that way when you're looking at property, because it is the case that for him, in the case of property, consent is a problem, 
Because what consent does, if you need everyone's consent to grab something and appropriate it, then it makes private property fragile, right? And the reason that Laslett and others triumph about the moves that he make is that he has found the way to make private property arch solid and extremely durable. And in a, in a way, I guess I'm all sort of answering also the, the, the Depeche uh, kind of issue, right? What the structuring work that this does. I guess, so that's one thing I'll say is that actually, you know, he is the guy who stabilizes, who locks in a highly contingent historical construct, right? Private property, pro property was not pri private prior to the 17th century. The default type of property was communal. And he, so this is entirely contingent, entirely historical, and he locks it in and it continues to be indeed, I think the pillar of capitalism today. So I guess this says something very briefly, I won't, um, I won't be too long on this, but about my style and indeed what I prefer to do, because it's the only way to answer your question about melodies. My style is not to tell the reader to take up arms and go to revolution. It is perhaps instead to stir perplexity, indeed anger, that this story that we have been buying for so long, for so long that we've ceased to really question private property as a pillar of our society, uh, that it's so full of contradictions and so, well, rubbish when you look at how it came about. Okay, so I guess what my, my style is, what I'm trying to do is to politicize epistemologically, right? That's what I call it, right? It is, it is through this work of denaturalizing, I aim to yeah, stir the anger that is required to no longer take for granted claims, um, the consistent claims and reproduction, uh, the, the work that capitalism, that, that private property does as a support of capitalism. So very briefly for the, for the readers who don't, who, who, who don't know why I think Locke is so important in the structuring work that he does. Well, get this, we owe to Locke the concept of personhood, the concept of self. He was the one who coined it. And he did that because of the way he reconfigured personhood from a, a theological concept to being a psychological concept. And he did that by way of the body. This is the, and the answer to your other question about the body. He did that by way of the body. We have a self in the same way that we own our own bodies, we own a self. Other great move, the self is expandable by labor, right? The sphere of selfhood is expandable through our labor. Whatever we labor on and, you know, and grab through our labor, we appropriate and expand the sphere of selfhood, right? Um, so, so far, so good. Okay, these are two. These are two things I could almost live with, right? Um, the problem in the story is the point where it gets configured with a story about with, with state making and the making of the state, and it happens in the following way: that Locke has, like Hobbes, um, but he has this distinction between, well, in his case, the state of nature and the state of war. Okay. And this distinction, one of the things I'm trying to, to show, is absolutely constitutive of the making of the state. But what does it enable him to do in the configuration of private property and its naturalization? Then he suddenly, in the state, with this distinction, right, the state of war is where he relegates a category of people right, that don't quite have the, this possibility of claiming what they labor. In other words, a category of people to whom he has denied exactly what he has constructed by way of the body, which is slaves. Okay, and uh, Stefano has explained uh, how how this how this how this uh, has gone into the has has meant, has rendered has well rendered why I think this is so important. But my point is that through this work of exclusions, right, that he, that are written into his own natural right to private property. Right, which I show these exclusions work for every single one of these rights. Right. Well, they ought to make us very angry. And uh, you know, I guess that's that it, it is a perhaps epistemological, perhaps too intellectual way of trying to remind people that there's something very wrong about the way in which private property not only came around but continues to structure our world. And um, yeah, I, I feel like stop. Uh, I might say something more if it comes to me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that through, through the work of knowing and understanding how these things come about, um, I guess I believe in the possibility of reclaiming that agency that we were talking about earlier in order to change it. I might say something more if it comes to me, but I think I actually I think it might be nicer to open the floor, Stefano. What do you think? 
Well, also yeah. Naeem might come back and then uh, you have a last exchange and then I open. Yeah, okay. Sounds good to me. Thanks, Charlotte. Was a quick coming back. <laughs> All right. Well, then, um, then now, yes. Actually, uh, maybe I will say something more because I. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to say something quite important about the way this distinction between the state of nature and the state of war, how that ties back to the, the way the bot I use the body, which for the for the sake of the of the uh, of the of the of our our, uh, our people who are with us here, which is that th this this leads me this tension is what leads me to have two ways of looking at the body. One is uh, the body, if you like, as the site of understanding what is the human. Okay, this two leg thing uh, from which we can gain knowledge of human nature and and the site the reference point for this human nature that is uh, used to naturalize on the one hand and then but that is stands in tension in my methodology with the particular bodies that get excluded through these distinctive moves okay and that is where uh, it's going to be more familiar to those of you who know the work on the body uh, this is where this times in more with feminist and post-colonial work where the focus has been on these excluded bodies right the bodies doing the work that don't get to own um, that are looked at but don't get to look right so those are the multiple bodies but I want to show I, I, I mobilize that as well in tension with the body to show the places where the story always gets uh, turns into a mode of exclusion in order to constitute that form that is the state con configurated with an inside um, against an outside. Yeah, I hope that's helpful to clarify the methodology. <laughs> well, thank you, Charlotte. Um, Naeem? Um, um, Charlotte, I have a question for you. Um, you know, the experience of writing articles and books and, and, and stories is for me um, has kind of two qualities. One is you have a plan and you know what you're thinking about writing and you know why you are doing it and therefore you execute an outline or you execute a plan and you execute a research program. So that's the first part, a necessary part. And then there's the second part, which is that the writing takes its own turn. The writing, uh, as I say, sometimes writes back to you things that you didn't expect that surprise you. So I was wondering if in this process of uh, this long, important project, there were, there were things that, that came, that wrote back to you that you found surprising. So I shouldn't say this because this is exactly how you shouldn't do a book, but I actually set out completely without a plan and was lost most of the time. <laughs> Perhaps this is not a thing to say at the launch, but it was nothing but surprise. Nothing but surprise that caused me to have to dig more and, 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 and go further. But I really can't and, and think, why am I doing this to myself was the constant question. So it was that was the state of being throughout the book, Naeem. So the first part is actually the one I tried to do, but was very quickly in the second option that you talked about. What? You're, you're muted. Uh, uh, fascinating. I would have guessed it the other way around. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's very often the effect of writing the book because then afterwards you you impose a structure which seems self-evident but was not self-evident whatsoever when, when you start doing it. I'm not sure that, for instance, the place of the body uh, was already so clear uh in, in the beginning because there is that uh, you can that you can feel a little bit in the writing that there's a there's a certain negotiation with the role of the body time and again uh through it um, also because it's a new idea that comes up yeah charlotte please <laughs> that's a good way of answering that question because it, it started with a with a puzzlement of perplexity i realized actually i was doing my work on surveillance right in fact that's how it started and on biometrics and the body was already there everywhere and then i started looking around uh and seeing that you had such a thing as the habeas corpus which is a very important legal instrument for defending the rights of the subject right suddenly that, that habeas corpus to have a body the body was there and little by little i started realizing the work that the body was doing quite systematic so it was really a process of and i guess that's supposed to be research discovery <laughs> central. so what was clear to me what was clear to me was that the body was important um what was not clear to me was how to how to make it do this work of denaturalizing uh that i've that i've tried to make it do uh, but uh but perhaps we could this is a chance for people to ask questions as well yeah, uh, and I have one. Uh, it's Andreas Bink. Um, hi, Andreas. Um, so congrats, Charlotte, for what is clearly a must-read book. Uh, one perhaps somewhat marginal question as it was up uh, by Stefano and Depeche. How would you explain your relationship to Foucault's work above all? 
on epistemes. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's super helpful. I mean, Foucault is, is is the arch reference, which is why I don't think of myself as a structuralist. He's a he's a reference methodologically, and in, in the in the fact that it's a genealogy. I guess my surprise. So there's there's there were two surprises that came up with Foucault. One is 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 wondering why he hadn't looked at the 17th century, um, and and also wondering why he hadn't looked at this. The, you know, for the, the the ultimate theorist of the of the of power and the relation to the body, why this fascinating institution that I argue is central to state making, the public anatomy lesson has escaped this has escaped this this uh, all knowing author. So that was a real surprise. The other one was around discipline, which uh, he also, uh, and even the word governmentality, um, and basically completely steps over, because he doesn't look at the 17th century, the work that Locke does, and the extent to which Locke was a theorist of discipline and of government, and uses governmentality, but he, he never grapples directly with the relation between government and governmentality. The business of episteme is also really important because, uh, well, so this is the, the work on, on words, uh, which is, is also uh, probably even the biggest work uh, and the biggest influence in all of this, with one qualifying difference. So what I find to be the most important break that Foucault identifies, but then he goes to, on, on to identify others, is the break uh, in the classical age between the word and the world. And that becomes, if you like, that's when I realized how absolutely constitutive that work that break was because in a world where the word is literally a thing and to to say a word is literally to to conjure a thing or to be a thing a magic formula right you can change something by pronouncing a magic formula this is what breaks with the classical episteme um, this is what breaks radically and suddenly words become the thing that orders the word world so this is also the moment where knowledge turns back on itself to look at itself, okay, which is all the work on epistemological classification. And Locke is a great epistemologist, so is Descartes. How to think, how do we think? So knowledge turns back on itself to order itself, but also words become this thing that orders the world and, and in this, but in this disconnected way. So then he goes on to make other uh, breaks. He sees other breaks. I find this one to be so important because, because again, he has, by that point, uh, I mean, Foucault doesn't go back to the 16th century, except in this early work. Um, I think this, 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 the classical episteme is perhaps the most important. But thanks for the question, Andreas. Um, and Andreas, thanks, you already in the Q&A. Um, we have two further, one by Lena Davidson, which is a statement, but I think can, we can therefore also take it earlier. This is not a question, but just a statement as a person with disability. I find that the people with disability are included, but not always recognized among the excluded bodies. Uh, I leave that behind because it might actually be more than just uh, a statement um, because it might um, get uh, Charlotte also for answering them. And then there's a question by Geronimo Ria. Hobbes has famously conceptualized the state as a fictional person or as a person by fiction. Taking that into account, what could be the corporal or bodily dimension of Hobbes' state? You are muted, Charlotte. Thanks for letting me know. Um, I'll take the direct question first, I guess. So Hobbes is the, is the, is the one who gives us this, this vision of the state as this entity made of actual bodies, uh, the personal corporate, the, 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 the person. But my reading of him is slightly different, which is that he does that at the same time as he becomes obsessed with the actual biological body. And this is a real tension in his reading. So I read him less as, I read him as a theorist of the state, but I read him as a theorist of the state that looks at the individual biological body in order to see the body. And in fact, I read him as the, therefore the theorist who articulates what I cons well, one of these other pieces of structuring works, which is the corporeal ontology of the state. The fact that the state is the thing that looks, that, that the state is the thing that focuses on bodies. So it's a tension in Hobbes, but I just wanna, I, I want to make that point by showing another key move that he makes, which is that Hobbes is also the one who says, the state has to, the ruler has to stop looking at the conscience, right? What's happening inside, because that's what leads to war, 
right? So everything that's happening in the mind or in the soul or all those things that lead you guys to the battlefield are off limits for political rule. The only thing that the state should look at is the body and the actual body. And somehow he also brings the state into, into view. But my focus is on the way he brings the individual body and, and constitutes it as the object of politics. Now for the excluded body, I, I mean, bodies with uh, disabilities. So I'm not extremely qualified uh, to talk about that, but I will say that the, 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 the logic of exclusions is what I'm trying to nail. And the way in which they just keep slipping in at key points where the promise of inclusion and the promise of universal rights that are supposed to be equally applicable to all just suddenly get short circuited. So, that's what I've looked at by looking at particular bodies, the, 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 the female body in the dissection and, uh, and the slave, which, uh, so this is a little bit before the race question comes into the picture uh, historically, but that's what creates the conditions of possibility for this to become racialized. So it's this process of exclusion that I'm trying to nail, but I'd welcome this to be excluded, uh, <laughs> extended uh, to show how it works also for the bodies that you mentioned. Thanks. We have for the time being no further question, but I will, I'm very happy to, um, to keep on talking so that there's more time for people to come up writing. Um, I think the, the... Maybe, maybe I'm happy to share something that, if, that was going to be an answer to, to Depeche's question that he didn't ask, if that's okay, uh, which is a way of talking about the, the, the anatomy uh, lesson uh, chat. Yeah. Okay and the gender dimension, which we haven't really discussed so far. No, but because I just mentioned it and you just came back to it. So it might be a good idea. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so uh, the, the question I thought that Deepesh was going to ask me was, 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 I mean, one of the reasons I go back to this original agency uh, that was that, that, that the 17th century na nailed, so to speak, and that we've been, that's been the agency we've been using since to put it that way, um, is, did this agency have to turn into mastery and domination? And I think decisively not. But going back to the beginning of the story under, helps us understand one of the ways in which it has. And this is the one of the things that we urgently, I think, need to reckon with, which is the way in which this agency was inherently masculinist and inherently gendered from the onset. So because I go back to the beginning of modern, uh, of, of modern science and, and particularly the, the, what happens on the dissection table, I found there, and this was a, a complete finding, uh, that there on the dissection table is revealed a complete fascination with one particular kind of body, which is the body that's capable of holding life, which is the female body. And uh, you'll, if you look at the book, you'll see that I, I find extremely important as a representation of modern science, and he does as well, Andrea Vesalius, who's, who writes the first manual of modern medicine, 1543, the same year as um, on the, on the uh, Cop Copernicus's book. So these are the two books that kickstart the scientific revolution. He features uh, on the frontispiece, uh, this dissection of the female body, which in actual practice was very rare, um, there weren't that many female bodies available. So it's particularly symbolic. So bear in mind, this is one of the foundational books of modern science. And what it represents is an all-male audience uh, peering, gazing. It's, 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 it's a big theater which is what's represented, peering into a, uh, a womb that's being opened up. And I read that as extremely significant of the form of agency that's being uh, constituted at this point of time. This is the agency that discovers that it can make states, okay? That it can make machines, that it doesn't need to just copy nature, that it can be genuinely inventive, that it is, that, that it is freed from God, right? But the one thing that it cannot make is the power is life. The power to make life becomes a thing that eludes this desire, well, this, 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 this desire for mastery, and I think is constitutive of it. So I think taking much more seriously, uh, and I'm, this is, in, I know in many ways that I'm not making a new point, but it was quite striking how it, how it jumped out, one of those surprises, but coming to terms with the, the extent to which mastering nature is co-constituted with the desire to master women and their desires, um, and not just their bodies, but their desires as well, is absolutely central to basically to the ecological catastrophe that interests Depeche, but also me. I'll make room for questions. Yeah, and there's one more by Craig Whittle, 
Um, habeas corpus is also an important point for Gambin's history of Western biopolitics in Homo Salsa. His next historical jump is to the French Revolution and the distinction or elision of the rights of man and citizen. The body makes the man, but does not make the citizen. Have you found any legacies of log bodies elsewhere in the theoretical underpinnings of the French or American revolutions? Well, uh, sorry, can you just say the last part again? The oh, right, uh, just a, a second. Have you found any legacies of log or bodies elsewhere in the theoretical underpinnings of the French or American revolutions? Yeah, so I would say, hmm, that's a complicated question. I would, yeah. say, <laughs> I would say that say that I would say that the French state and the French revolution and the state that comes out of it is actually extremely Hobbesian. That, that I, 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 see, I see quite centrally. Um, Locke is a strange absence. I, I somehow suspect that this is one of the reasons why he's not in Foucault. Um, he's mentioned twice in the lectures, but, but, uh, but in passing and together with Hobbes. Um, he's quite central in the American uh, constitution and in the American system, I would say, Locke is. Um, so, no, there are ways in which they are two different things. But I think, I mean, what's behind your question, and I've, been, I've asked myself this question before, is why I went to the English Revolution and not the French Revolution. I could, or at least I'm interpreting it that way. And that's because, because of what, uh, what I found important to, to, to explore and which is again my 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 quibble with Foucault, I guess, which is that prior to this assujettissement, prior to this subjection, to this becoming subject, I do think that in the English Revolution there was something more open on the side of agency, which then again I think it's the same agency that is the agency of modern science, but that there is something in which Foucault closes too quickly on the possibility of the subject pushing back, which is what happened during the English Revolution, which is what happened with habeas corpus. And so this way in which the subject um, is a word, I mean, ma the making of the subject is literally, I can't remember the exact terms, but the word that, that Hobbes uses, the constitution of the subject as a site of resistance, and Hobbes was a theorist of resistance, very, very surprisingly, is something that really interests me. Agamben, yes, he goes there, but I mean, he doesn't look at practices. He goes there, he goes over it very quickly, and then he moves on. Um, I, I really wanted to stay with the thickness of the contingencies of history and the practices. Um, I do find him a bit frustrating, but I only realized that he had that insight after having started gone there. But that's my own, uh, yeah, <laughs> sense of, yeah, needing to be rigorous, I think. Thanks, Charlotte. Any other questions? I mean, by now, people had probably the time to think about whether they wanted to add something in the Q&A. That seems not be be the case. If that is so, then I'm I'm very happy to thank Naim again for being here, and also to Deepa Shakabati, who was uh, had to leave, as you know, um, beforehand. But there will be some ongoing discussion, if I understood correctly, um, since he offered it to Charlotte. And of course, I thank most Charlotte uh, for having made her time available to discuss the book as well and uh, to everyone who was in the room. It will be available. Uh, and uh, so anyone um, you, who might want to go over particular things will have the opportunity to do so. Great. And I would also, uh, I would be remiss, uh, Stefano, if I didn't really sincerely thank you for taking the task of <laughs> introducing the book. And Naeem, you as well. And also, especially all the, the, everyone who made it tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to discuss the book with you. Of course, it would have been better in person, but um, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day, evening, night, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye.